What is up guys, Adam here with Power Sports Builds and today's video is going to be all about doing the top end on the engine for this bike. So we've gotten pretty far in this engine and it looks pretty sick but we're going to be taking it to that next level today and I'm going to cover in detail pretty much everything you need to know about this process. I've seen a lot of people making mistakes on their top end rebuilds. From what I've seen there are just a few steps they're overlooking so I'm going to share with you guys exactly what I do when I'm doing a top end. So let's get to work here. Okay guys, so to start off with the cylinder, I'm gonna remove these studs in the cylinder the same way I removed them from the bottom end using uh, one nut threaded on and then threading the other nut against it. And this will allow me to pull out all these rusty old studs since I will be replacing them. And now that we have all of our head studs removed, I'm going to start working on the power valve here. You'll want to start with this nut and remove this nut will allow you to get to the rest of the assembly. And then we'll grab our washer off of here followed by the spring and our arm flap valves. We'll just pull these off with a pair of needle nose pliers. And then sometimes these will come off as a group or they'll come off separately. It just depends. And then our clip here, we'll just take the needle nose pliers and pull it off. And now I can thread this nut onto here. This is a different nut than what I used to assemble it. Sometimes these shafts can be pretty sticky. So I'll take a pair of walking grip, grip pliers, grab onto that nut and pull it out. Notice how I have a rag under the cylinder to protect it. And as you can see, there's a good reason for servicing these because they do get a pretty good amount of carbon buildup on them. Now we can see our flaps are loose in the cylinder because we took the shaft out of them. So now we can push them out from the exhaust side here. Might have to wiggle this one around a little bit and then it'll push through into the cylinder. And then if we look at these power valve flaps here we can see there's a lot of carbon buildup on them so it's definitely a good time to get these guys cleaned up. And now I'll remove this seal here for the power valve shaft. It seems to be in there pretty good so I had to pry on it a lot. And this was actually as you can see after I pull it out here, this was actually like the worst seal I've ever seen. It was completely corroded, so definitely time to replace this. Okay, so the next step before we put this all back in is going to be cleaning the carbon out of our cylinder here. And then I'm going to clean up this shaft as well as our power valve flaps here. Get all the carbon off of them in the parts washer. Also, if you guys haven't really seen the power valve assembly before or are curious what it's all about, I made a video on this that's super detailed, so I'll have that tagged at the end of this one if you want to check it out. And then this clip here as well as this bracket piece were a little corroded so I decided to shoot them off in the sandblaster. And I seem to have everything pretty much cleaned up here but before I put it into the engine I'm going to show you guys how I prep my cylinders. Okay guys so I could make a 10 minute video alone on how to prep your cylinders but I'm trying to keep it short and condensed for you guys but when it comes to cylinder prep on two strokes there's a lot of misunderstanding or conflicting ideas from engine builders so a lot of people use a flex ball hone like this or a brush hone like what Wiseco sells. Um, at the end of the day these are okay to use but you have to be careful of the balls catching in the two stroke cylinder ports because they'll catch in there. I do use ball hones if the cylinder is pretty worn meaning up and down lines consistently in the cylinder but basically what I'll do on this cylinder is just use scotch bright because it's not that worn compared to some cylinders. It's in actually in pretty good shape because you can see the uh, cross hatching here still from the last time it was honed. 
So the basic reason why you use scotch Bright or anything to clean up your cylinders is because after running it, it gets glazed inside the cylinder wall and it won't allow your rings to seat properly and create a high compression engine. So I'll work side to side at like a 45 degree angle to create a cross hatching pattern. Then after you've created that pattern, it's important to clean out your cylinder. Instead of using solvent for this, uh, dish soap works a lot better in removing the uh, glaze, the nicosil that we took off there. So you can see there's still a lot, so I'm gonna work a rag in here until that rag comes out clean. All right, now that our cylinder is all cleaned up, the next thing we need to do is measure the distance between the piston and the cylinder. This is important because it allows me to see whether the piston is too big for the cylinder, which could cause it to seize up in the cylinder, or whether the piston is too small for the cylinder, which could in turn cause a loss in compression. If you guys haven't heard of cylinder to bore clearance before, it's the distance between the piston and the cylinder, so it's usually a really small distance that you need to have down between a few hundredths of a millimeter. So Honda says that the service limit for a cylinder to piston clearance is going to be 0 0.07 millimeters. But since we are going with the aftermarket piston, I want to look at what Vertex recommends and they recommend a clearance of 0 0.05 millimeters to 0 0.06. So that's what we'll be going with. So to start off, I'm just going to write down before I measure what the actual cylinder to bore clearance should be, so it's going to be that 0.05 to 0 0.06 millimeters. So to measure this clearance, you'll need two measuring tools. One's going to be a vernier caliper. I have a digital one here. So using a digital caliper like this will work on a 125 piston, but if you get up to a 450 piston like this, it's not going to get you an accurate reading because you can see it doesn't get all the way around the uh, skirts here, so we would need a micrometer for that. So Vertex says the piston is 53.94 millimeters, but we're just going to verify that by measuring the skirts here. You'll want to measure on the skirt, and we can see that we do get around 53.93 or 53.94 millimeters. And now to calculate our cylinder diameter, we'll use a cylinder bore gauge here, and we'll use uh, different collets depending. You'll want the cylinder bore gauge to be just barely bigger than the cylinder because the cylinder bore gauge will tell you how much smaller the cylinder is than the bore gauge. So to determine the reading of the cylinder, the first thing I need to do is get an accurate reading on the size of the cylinder bore gauge. So I'll run my caliper up and down to get the cylinder bore gauge straight in it and it seems like the reading I'm getting is 2.132 inches. So if you guys didn't get that, 2.132 inches is the size of our cylinder bore gauge, and then we'll measure how much smaller the cylinder is than the bore gauge. That's what it will tell us, and then we'll subtract that from this reading. And now we can put the cylinder bore gauge into the cylinder, and how you'll get the reading of how much smaller the cylinder is than it is you'll go back and forth and look for the high spot. So that's when the cylinder bore gauge is straight. So if we look closely here, the high spot is one notch past five thousandths of an inch. And after I get that first reading, I try and get a lot of different readings on different parts of the cylinder to make sure they're all pretty similar. And on this cylinder, they were all within five ten thousandths of an inch of each other. So I'll just give you guys a close up here on how to read this gauge, but we're getting one tick past five thousandths of an inch so we'll be at five and a half thousandths of an inch or you can take 0 0.0005 and multiply that by however many ticks off of zero you are and that'll be your reading now what i'll do is i'll subtract this measurement so minus 0.0055 inches and that'll come out to be 2.1265 inches and that it's our cylinder diameter, but we still need to convert this back to metric to compare it to our piston. Siri, what is 2.1265 inches in millimeters? 2.1265 inches is equivalent to about 54.01 millimeters. And now we can take the reading for our cylinder and subtract it by the reading we had for our piston. And this will leave us with 0.07 millimeters. 
So the reading we got was 0 0.07 millimeters, so that's one hundredth of a millimeter over the spec that Vertex Pistons recommended. I'm not too concerned about that. I think that's right in the range with our equipment. You know, we're going to be one to a two hundredths of a millimeter off anyways, so it's just going to give us a sense of what range we need to be in, and we're right in that range, so I'm happy with that. If you wanted an exact reading, you could take it to a machine shop, but... You know, if I was 0.12 millimeters or something like that, I would be concerned, or even 0.1 millimeters, and I would probably send the cylinder out to get replated. But at this point, I think that reading is right where we want to be. And the next thing we'll need to measure is our ring end gap. So I'll push the piston ring about a quarter of an inch in, and then we can take our piston and push the ring down about another quarter to half inch into the cylinder to make sure it's straight. If we look at Vertex recommendations here for two-stroke engines, they recommend 0.15 to 0.23 millimeters of ring end gap per inch of bore. So we just measured our bore at 2.1 inches, so we'll multiply those numbers by 2.1. So that'll put our spec at about 0.32 millimeters, and this is a 0.3 millimeter feeler gauge, so we want this to fit, and it does fit through that end gap. So now we'll take our 0.33 millimeter feeler gauge, and this one fits pretty easy as well, so this one is not the size. And next I'm going to try a 0.35, and this one has a little bit of grab, but not enough. I think it might just be one size bigger. Okay, so this is 0.38 millimeters, and this one does not fit, so you can see I had to force the piston ring to move a little bit to get it in. So we know our spec's going to be between 0.32 and 0.49 and what we ended up getting was between 0.35 and 0.38 millimeters so we're definitely within spec. If you guys are wondering what you do if you're above that 0.49 you would probably want to get your cylinder re nicosil plated or get a bigger piston kit for it. A lot of times when you get an aftermarket piston the ring end gap is going to be a little bit too small so I'll show you guys how I get my ring end gaps back into that range. So there's a couple ways to adjust your uh, piston ring size. So you can use a fine file on this, but I save that for bigger rings like this four-stroke ring. If you take a look at this two-stroke ring here, the ends on it are super skinny, so it'd be pretty easy to catch on that file and damage them. So I'll take 600 grit sandpaper and just fold it up into a nice and even square and then run the ring over it nice and even. I won't actually run this one because it's already within spec. Now that we've verified our piston to cylinder clearance and everything is all good, we'll start with our oil seal and putting our power valve assembly back on. Okay, so I'll apply a little grease here and then go ahead and hammer it in with a socket that fits around the outer edge of it. Okay, now I'll go ahead and show you guys how to install your power valve flaps. It is pretty hard to show on camera, but I'll do my best here. Okay, so I'm gonna work it in vertically here from the bottom. And normally they sit in there horizontally, but you have to get them in vertically on this right one. And then I'll flip around to the exhaust port side, see if I can rotate it around into that groove. And it looks like I got it rotated here. So now I'm just gonna turn around and verify that it's sitting in there good. And the one on the left side here is much easier to install because you can install it horizontally like how it sits in there. And now I can just push it up onto the ledge and everything looks good, so we'll go ahead and install our shaft. Just pop this clip on here. Torque spec for this nut's going to be around six and a half foot pounds. So now that we have our power valve assembly all clean, we can definitely tell it moves a lot smoother. If you guys remember from the last video, I didn't have the dowel pins to put in on this case, so I just put it on anyways to see how it would look. But I got those in, and I also want to explain how the power valve and the bottom end works, or how you assemble it a little better, because I had a couple questions on that. So in the service manual it says to install this power valve arm with it facing straight upwards. If you install it like this or even like this, 
the arm will not be able to reach the power valve assembly on the top end so you need to put it in there while the arm's straight and then as you go to install the governor gear here it's going to push that arm back so you may have to rotate the power valve arm back like five degrees to get the uh, governor gear to line up with it but after you get it back a little bit then you can push the governor gear in and it'll rotate that arm where it needs to be so right here is perfect and you'll notice it lines up right with the end of that rubber grommet if you need something to look at so now I'm going to install all the bolts and now we can install our base cylinder studs you can see there's a round end and a flat end the flat end is going to get threaded down also I'm going to install some anti-seize lubricant onto these because they do get seized in there pretty good And now that the bottom end is all ready for the piston, I'm just going to show you guys how I install the circlips. So you won't want to install it to the side like that. You'll want to install it straight up and down so it stays in there while the engine's operating. And I like to start by putting one end in and then kind of pushing the other end down in there as far as I can. And then if I need to, I'll grab a screwdriver and work the screwdriver under the circlip without damaging the outside of the piston. And then I can just lightly wedge it and it will pop in there. And now I can install the piston ring. So if there's a marking on the piston ring, that will go up for a compression ring. So there's a marking that says T on it. So that T will go towards the top. And then I'll put part of this ring on and then work the other side on around the ring end groove there. And when we go to put this into the cylinder, we want to make sure these rings are lined up with this little notch here. So I put a little bit of two-stroke oil into this cup here, and I'm going to put some on our needle bearing, and then slide it into the end of the connecting rod and work it around in there to get the both of them lubed up. And then I can install our piston. This arrow is going to go forward towards the front tire or the exhaust side of the bike. And then I'll slide in my wrist pin part way, and then I'll get the piston lined up on the connecting rod and push it through all the way up against the circlip we installed. And next I'll put a rag in here to protect the bottom end as I go to install this second side circlip. So I'll put the same thing as before, I'll put one end in and then push the other end over and pop it in with the screwdriver here. And now I'm going to install our cylinder base gasket here. I'm actually going to be installing two of the OEM ones and I'll explain to you guys why later on in the video. And then we don't want to forget our dowel pins here as we go to install the cylinder. And when you're installing your cylinder onto the bike, just lube it up with a little bit of two-stroke oil. Don't use too much or any assembly lube because it'll cause the cylinder to glaze. And then I'll put a little bit on the piston here and make sure the ring's lined up as I go to put the cylinder on. I'll kind of work it over one end of the ring first and then slide it over the back end of the ring. And then I should have it all the way on there and then lift it up just a little bit and then lock it down under those dowel pins. And it feels good to finally have this cylinder and piston all together. And now I can install the power valve arm. So don't forget this little collar piece here. And then just latch the arm onto that. And then we can make sure that this piece is sitting all the way on this pin here. So that, that we know the power valves are in the right position. And then we'll put this little clip piece in. I do recommend getting a new one of these from Honda. And then I'm not going to install this cover right now. Because I'm going to Cerakote it with a bunch of other parts later. And this is one of my favorite parts of rebuilding an engine here, watching the piston go up and down in the reed cage. It's pretty sweet to look at. And this engine also does feel extremely smooth.
Okay guys, so I got something really awesome to introduce to you here. Basically what this is, is a cylinder head that I got from Fathead Racing. So Lucas over there sent one over to me and he sent over a few different domes as well, which is what goes on the inside of this. But as you can see, this has a super cool anodized finish on it that's going to match up with this oil plug here on the engine as well as a lot of the other parts on the bike. So this thing's really going to fit in with this engine. And these cylinder heads are not only going to affect the looks of the bike, but they're also going to affect the performance. So the two part design here, you have the cylinder dome and then you have the head. So the dome slides right into here and this allows for improved cooling as well as higher compression. So you could switch out the domes based on what compression you want to get. But a higher compression is just going to mean more power for your engine. So definitely something to look into. These things are made in the USA and they have lifetime warranty on the head bodies. So I'll put these down in the description for you guys to check out for your bike because they look absolutely sweet on there. So he sent me over an H14, an H13, and an H12. So the H12 is going to be close to your stock compression. The H13 will be somewhere in the middle and the H14 is going to be the higher compression. So this will allow me to run racing fuel with the bike and get some pretty sweet performance gains with it. But the nice thing about having the H12 or the H13, if I wanna run a lower octane fuel, if I'm gonna be taking this bike on the trails or something, I could switch to the stock compression and still get really good performance on a lower octane fuel. And then the last thing he sent over is this set of O-rings here. So this cylinder head does reduce the need for a head gasket, so I'll be using these O-rings instead. And now I'll grease up the o-ring on this dome and then I can pop it into the cylinder head real quick. And now I'll start working this o-ring into the head body here. So I'll just work it all the way around until it completely pops into the groove there. And then I can start on the inner o-ring and this one just pops right in pretty easy here. Wow, this engine came out absolutely amazing guys it feels really good to put all this work into it and see how amazing it looks so if you guys enjoyed the video hit that like button for me and i'll see you next time